Hello and welcome to Sean White's Solar and Energy Storage Podcast. The title of this podcast is Solar Energy Fundamentals, Part 3. In this episode, we are going to cover air mass, global solar radiation, direct solar radiation, albedo solar radiation, diffuse solar radiation, bifacial solar modules, pyranometers, pyroheliometers, and the solar constant. To have fun and learn more about solar and storage, go to solar, S-E-A-N, that's solarshawn.com. Did you hear the one about the restaurant on the moon? Yeah, great food, horrible atmosphere. Ah, Okay, let's get serious here. Let's talk about the atmosphere, the Earth atmosphere, because that's where most of us are going to be installing our solar modules or designing our solar systems. When they test solar modules, they do it at what's called standard test conditions. Theoretically, if the sun was straight over your head and you were at sea level, that would be one atmosphere. Unless you're in the tropics, the sun will never be straight over your head. So they test the solar modules at 1.5 atmospheres. If we wanted to, we could do some trig to figure out angle, but we don't do trig until we get to the advanced level. With thicker atmosphere, it filters light differently. The sun is called a yellow dwarf star, That means it's small, but it doesn't mean that it's yellow. It's actually a white star. The reason that our sun looks orange in our drawings a lot of times is because as the light gets filtered through the atmosphere, especially at sunrise and sunset, takes out the blue and leaves us with orange. That's red and yellow. Do you know your primary colors? I was a coronavirus kindergarten homeschooler. So it takes out the blue, you get orange light as it goes down towards sunrise and sunset. With all that thickness of atmosphere, that's why you can almost look straight at the sun as it sets. Less so in places with very clear air, such as perhaps places in Arizona, because with that clear air, it doesn't block out as much of the light, which is another reason why solar is really good in places around Arizona. And not to forget the Sahara Desert and Australia, different desert types of places. Another place where there's less atmosphere is a mountaintop. So if you're in Colorado, they call Denver the Mile High City, that's a miles less atmosphere over your head so you can get better performance, better light, better current. Because remember, light gives us current. Cold temperatures will give us more voltage, but most of all, light, that's what we want. We're photovoltaic. Photo means light. Voltaic means voltage. And more light, That means more photons knock more electrons loose, which gives us more current. On the back of every solar module, it tells us what STC is. So if you're somebody that deals with solar modules, you can study while you're looking at the back. Don't get tricked on an exam by multiplying VOC or ISC, because VOC and ISC, those are places where you don't make any power. VOC means turned off, ISC means shorted out. Back to the atmosphere. If we have less of it, it's better for solar. One of the things that you notice about China is the atmosphere is so polluted that solar doesn't work so well in those places where they're using all the power, you know, like Shanghai, Beijing, and a lot of these big cities. It's funny in China, they will call a million person city a village because it's so small. One thing I've heard that all that pollution helps prevent the earth from getting hotter because it reflects away some of the light. Isn't that crazy? You don't hear people, though, saying, let's make more pollution to prevent the Earth from getting too hot. Are you pro-pollution? So as you go up in the atmosphere, there's less molecules, so there's less filtering, and it gets more dense at the bottom. So just remember, one and a half air masses is part of standard testing conditions and all the other testing conditions, too. Another thing that will thicken that air pretty commonly is water. So if you go to a humid place, it's going to be more of an air mass. Your software will take all of that into consideration and your weather data. So you don't have to worry about doing calculations for air masses on pieces of paper because the information age has you taken care of. Let's talk about some physics and some geometry. What we have are different angles. So the sun hitting the PV. Because the sun is constantly moving around in the sky throughout the solar window, remember the solar window is where the sun will be in the sky at some point throughout the year. It is rarely perpendicular to the plane of the array, which has to do with the tilt and the azimuth. On many systems, in fact, they are never facing the sun, but they still can pay off. If you're close to facing the sun, you're doing pretty good. If you have a dual axis tracker, which is expensive and has a lot of things that can break down, you can face the sun all the time. Not too many people do dual axis trackers anymore because they add extra expense. 
they might get you 30% more energy throughout the year and cost you more than 30% more, especially with the price of PV being so competitive. But then again, these dual axis trackers are so neat. One of the ways that Soloflect made it work as a company, they invented the system, they manufactured the system, and they installed the system. So they got it down to install it quick, and that's all they do. If they were doing different types of rooftop arrays and things, they wouldn't have that mass production thing down as well. So the best that you can do is perpendicular to the sun. Yes, that's right. That orange, or we learned white ball up in the sky that keeps on moving throughout the day. Now at a different angle. If we're looking at 40 degrees from perpendicular, we're still getting 77% of that energy in the plane of the array. That means that those sunbeams are spread out a little bit. We're getting less photons per square meter. That's why when we were looking at the insulation data, it did matter which way the PV modules were tilted. Sometimes if you're looking at some sources, such as NASA, they might be telling you how much solar energy you're going to get on the flat Earth, not tilted towards the sun. And solar energy experts like to know what the energy is going to be tilted towards the sun. So if you're into trig, perhaps you're an engineer, we can get this information using trig. Also, as the sun gets to be at a greater angle, we get more reflection. Just like if you're looking at the highway, Sometimes if you look far enough away, it's a great enough angle that you'll get reflections even off of pavement. Or is that a mirage? Another thing about greater angles is you're going to have more atmosphere to filter those sun rays, which is not as good for production. 90 degrees to perpendicular, we are getting no direct beam solar radiation. But as you know, even on a cloudy day, even when it's snowing, even when there's snow on your array, you are still producing some but maybe not much, energy. Now with the different types of solar radiation. First of all, we have global solar radiation, and that's all kinds of solar radiation put together. Global solar radiation is what is collected with our typical flat plate solar PV modules. Pretty much that's all we're using these days, is flat plate solar PV modules. An example of solar collectors that are not flat plate would be concentrating solar, and that only works with direct beam radiation. So if we want to measure the irradiance from global solar radiation, that's all different types together. That's direct, diffuse, and albedo. We would use something called a pyranometer. Pyranometer used to be on the NABCEP associate exam. Haven't heard much about that recently. So the spaceship looking thing, that's a pyranometer. It measures global solar radiation. You will see oftentimes at large solar farms. When somebody invests hundreds of millions or even billions of dollars in a solar farm, you bet they're going to invest in one to see exactly what the irradiance is doing so they'll perhaps know how to do maintenance. They'll track when it's a good time to wash the array and just to see exactly what the sun is doing. Some other devices that people oftentimes use for commissioning, I don't hear them calling them pyranometers, but they sort of are. They're irradiance meters. They're portable ones called a day star, somewhere around 150 bucks. You would also want to measure the temperature of the array. You can actually plug into a temperature sensor that you attach to the back of the module so you know how hot your module is, and it takes different things into consideration, such as tilt and azimuth. We call that commissioning. When you go out to a solar system and you measure things like this and compare that to what your expected performance would be under those conditions to see if your array is operating like it should be. O&M or commissioning and maintenance is very popular. And of course, NABCEP has a certification called the NABCEP PV Commissioning and Maintenance Specialist Certification. Some of you might be here preparing for that exam. If you are, I would recommend going to some of the different websites and studying the manuals and learning how to do commissioning and maintenance with these devices. Great learning experience for people that do commissioning and maintenance. Now we're on to direct beam radiation. And direct beam radiation was what we were talking about when we were talking about these angles for aiming your solar module at the sun. If you have concentrating solar, that means that you would have solar that uses mirrors or lenses to concentrate a larger area of sunlight onto a small solar cell if it was concentrated PV, or power towers where we would have thousands of mirrors focusing on a collector on a big power tower. Then you're only using direct beam solar radiation. Some of you, when you were naughty boys, might have used a magnifying glass to burn ants. That would be an unethical use 
of concentrated solar power. So there's a story going around that Archimedes in 212 BC used concentrated solar to down a Roman fleet. Maybe we could learn from that and use concentrated solar to down satellites. Hey, do you believe? Why not? Some places are better than other places for concentrated PV. Places with clouds are not so good for concentrated PV. Places without many clouds, like Arizona, where you get 300 plus sun days a year, those places are much better for concentrated PV. However, with the price of PV being so cheap, it just doesn't make sense to do concentrated PV because also you need to have a very accurate tracker to track the sun to know exactly where the sun's going to be to collect those sunbeams because that darn sun is moving all the time. Too bad we don't have a tidally locked planet. Yeah, you astronomers know what I'm talking about. So we measure direct beam radiation with something called a pyroheliometer. A pyroheliometer has to always face the sun. So if you're just doing commissioning and maintenance, you could take a pyroheliometer out there and aim it at the sun yourself. Or if you have it at a solar farm, you would have to have it on a tracker tracking the sun. And so the pyroheliometer is only going to be measuring the direct sunbeams. You could, for instance, too, get the solar radiation from the direct sunbeams and subtract that from the global radiation measured by the pyranometer, and then you would come up with the remaining diffuse and albedo radiation. So when I've gone out to some of these larger solar farms, I've seen different stations where they measure global and direct beam radiation. Now let's talk about diffuse radiation. Diffuse radiation is what you get from diffusing the sunlight. It's the non-direct solar radiation and the non-reflected albedo solar radiation. Diffuse radiation is what you get from clouds, haze, and blue sky. It's interesting that the blue sky is 10 to 20% of the solar radiation on a clear day and 100% of the radiation on an overcast day and 0% of the radiation in space. So if you're one of those people that lives on the moon, yeah, hey, I'm just trying to future-proof this class, you might not have to worry about diffuse radiation. Now we're down to albedo. Albedo radiation is reflected. You get reflected solar energy from the snow, from a white roof. Sometimes they call that a cool roof, energy-efficient roof. There's a lot of rules even in California where you have to install white roofs on commercial buildings to keep the buildings cool. Some of you might have heard of lead buildings, and people get lead points for white roofs. Maybe that's not such a good idea, though, in the Arctic. You might want to have a black roof up there to keep your building warm. Even green grass reflects a certain amount of sunlight that your solar modules will collect. And lakes. We do design our solar modules not to reflect sunlight. I've seen sometimes where airports get kind of freaked out when you put solar near the airport. But hey, our solar modules were not designed to reflect light. Perhaps even the window from a building would be more dangerous than a solar module. And they do build plenty of buildings near airports, such as terminal buildings. And there are a lot of airports where they are installing solar. Denver has a nice solar array. I was recently in Indianapolis. They have some nice solar and it's all over the place, really. Solar is on tons of airports, San Francisco, everywhere. Now they just have to figure out how to power those jet planes with electricity. Oh, whoops, I got to future-proof this class. Yeah, aren't those electric jets great? So we do have some solar arrays that are designed to take better advantage of albedo sunlight. There was a famous company, not so famous anymore, but if you were around in 2008, you would have heard about Solyndra, but that's a long time ago, so most of you forgot about that. They went bankrupt, they got a big DOE grant, but they were really neat. When they had their solar tubes out there at the solar shows, everybody was checking those out. They're thin film. They put different films around these tubes. And actually, each one of these tubes would be considered technically a solar module. So they would put them up on a white reflective roof. The roof would be part of the solar system, actually was eligible for a tax credit. It installed super quick, and it was really good at capturing that reflected light. They would say you would get 20-something percent more solar radiation from that albedo. They say if you're working on a white reflective roof that you can get sunburn up your nose. So it's really dangerous from a skin cancer point of view to work on a white reflective roof. So we're getting direct solar radiation, albedo, Beto bouncing off the back, and of course, diffuse. You can still see these Solyndra modules for sale on eBay. People still love them. There's one guy out there that I've met a few times trying to bring them back to life. One time I was in the audience at the Colbert Report in New York City, and I was wearing my Solyndra shirt after Solyndra went bankrupt, and Stephen asked me about Solyndra, and I told him that Solyndra was the corporate messiah and would be raised from the dead. Stephen then told his bodyguards to keep an eye out for me. 
I wonder if they're still watching. Then we have bifacial modules. These are very popular right now because, for one thing, there's been some exemptions to tariffs on bifacial modules, but that goes back and forth. But it was good for stimulating the bifacial industry. Bifacial means two faces, and these two-faced modules can capture sunlight from the backside. Some people think it's a little bit overhyped because the sun doesn't shine from the backside, but they can take advantage of albedo. That's reflected light. Remember, the solar cells are connected together in series. Even if you have partial shading of some cells on the backside of modules because of where your rack is connected, it could interrupt the flow of current and reduce the output of the module like the whole backside was shaded. Bifacial modules, they're kind of neat. They look beautiful. Albedo is also known for reflecting energy back into space. If we have more things that are lightly colored, some say it could reduce global warming, such as white roofs, white streets, making your pavement lighter. Even glaciers reflect light into space. We have a positive feedback loop. As glaciers melt, then the oceans collect more energy and that would heat earth up more. One of the things that's happening too is with all the coal burning that's going on and pollution, especially in China, it goes way up into the atmosphere and then some of it lands down on glaciers as little black spots. And then those little black spots melt the glaciers even faster. Remember, pyranometer measures global solar radiation and pyro means fire and meter means to measure. So it's a fire measuring device. And yeah, you could say the sun is a big ball of fire. Goodness gracious, great balls of fire. Do, 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 whatever. Pyroheliometer just means fire sun measuring device. And so that's pointed right straight at the sun. No albedo or diffuse there. Albedo means reflected. Astronomers also talk a lot about albedo because when you are looking at moons and planets, that's all reflected or albedo radiation. There's something that my friend Bill Brooks makes fun of is that the bifacial test conditions instead of STC, they call it BSTC. And he thinks that the bifacial modules are a bunch of BS. <laughs> Everybody has their own opinion. By the way, if you wanted to see everything that I see on the trade show floors, I posted it on the internet on something called Instagram. My Instagram address is Sean White Solar, or you can go to solarshawn.com and get there from there. So I like to end off some lessons with some interesting facts that are oftentimes relevant. There's a famous movie out there called The Martian with Matt Damon in it. And the author that wrote The Martian also wrote a book called Artemis. Artemis is Apollo's twin sister and the name of a program that's going to return humanity to the moon. It's been quite a while, huh? So let's have a talk about solar radiation. When we were talking about solyndra and bifacial modules, we were talking a lot about albedo. But on the moon, there's no diffuse radiation because it has a terrible atmosphere. And in the book Artemis, in one of the action scenes, you can hide in the shadows. I heard they're going to make a movie out of this one too. Can't wait. I like that stuff. So in space at 93 million miles from the sun, which is the sun and moon, we get 1,366 watts per square meter. That's called the solar constant. There's no diffuse radiation, which on Earth, 10 or 20 percent, of the radiation on a blue sky day is not coming directly from the sun, it's diffusing through the atmosphere. So wouldn't that be cool to be able to hide in a shadow? With no atmosphere, the sky is dark. Like on the moon, it might be a beautiful sunny black sky day. If I'm way high in the sky in a big jet airplane and I look up, that blue gets kind of dark. One of the things that I see on all the solar trade shows lately are bifacial modules. It's the hype. In this industry, just be a little wary of hype. We were talking about Solyndra. Everybody thought that was going to change the industry. Whenever anybody says this is going to revolutionize the industry, beware. We're using the same technology with small incremental increases in efficiency that Bell Labs started using in 1954. That's crystalline silicon rectangular modules that capture sunlight on one side. We see things like BIPV getting a lot of hype. That's building integrated photovoltaic. Thin film has had a lot of hype traditionally. It's going to revolutionize the industry in two years. Nobody will ever buy crystalline again. We've heard that many times over. And you might have heard of solar roadways. Yeah, right. Like I'm going to drive semi trucks on PV. How about cheap mass produced rectangular modules that are about one meter wide that have 60 or 72 cells in it? Cheap PV. That's what revolutionizes the industry. Cheap energy. So now solar is the cheapest energy in the world. Thanks for listening. And to learn more about the sun and everything else, 
go to solarsean.com.